Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. A stunning development tonight. The guilty verdicts for Epstein pal Glenn Maxwell could now be overturned. Two jurors who may have swayed other members of the jury by telling them about their own past histories of sexual abuse. And it's unclear if the court even knew about it. But first, it is a new day in New York and Los Angeles and maybe a good day for some criminals. The Big Apple's brand new chief prosecutor is already making waves by rolling out a policy that is anything but tough on crime. This just weeks after his counterpart on the West Coast did the same. New York and Los Angeles are among a number of major cities across America instituting criminal justice procedures which de-emphasize low-level crime, with the district attorneys not even prosecuting many of those types of cases. But are all the crimes these cities are identifying as minor, really minor? Los Angeles District Attorney George Gascon rolled out his city's new procedures in early December. This week, Manhattan DA, um, the new district attorney there, Alvin Bragg, followed suit. The policies in both cities are essentially designed to make jail time to quote DA Bragg, quote, a last resort. Now, sure, some like marijuana use or traffic violations or worthy candidates for leniency, maybe even subway fare jumping in New York or prostitution. But resisting arrest? Why shouldn't that always be considered a serious offense? For all the criticism and focus on officer-involved shootings in America, allowing criminals to resist arrest seems very likely to me to lead to even more of those dangerous incidents. Both New York and L.A. seem prepared to turn a blind eye towards that offense. And that's just for starters. In L.A., the D.A. will no longer seek bail for any nonviolent offense, meaning those suspected to have committed you know, auto theft, destruction of property, will be back on the streets hours after the alleged crimes. And Manhattan DA Bragg also outlined a drastically higher bar for the crimes where his office will even seek jail time, saying, quote, the office will not seek a carceral sentence other than for homicide or other cases involving the death of a victim, a Class B violent felony in which a deadly weapon causes serious physical injury, Domestic violence felonies, sex offenses, public corruption, rackets, or major economic crimes. No carceral sentences, in other words, means no prison time for crimes like armed robbery, threatening police officers, and more. Philadelphia, New Orleans, other major metropolitan areas are also jumping on the get soft on crime bandwagon. But does it work? Well, the first major city to install this sort of laissez-faire criminal justice code was Baltimore which rolled out its new regulations in April of this year. And since those policies were implemented almost all the way across the board, crime has gone up in 2021. Homicides up 3%, the new policies, auto theft 4% up, rapes up 2%, common assault went up 8%. Now look, tough to say whether it's cause and effect, but joining us now is Jillian Snyder. She leads the criminal justice and civil liberties team at the nonpartisan R Street Institute. She's also an adjunct lecturer at John Jay College in New York. She spent 13 years as an NYPD officer. Also with us, another retired officer, Sean Sticks Larkin from the Tulsa Police Department. Thanks to both of you for coming on. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Jillian, let me ask you, first of all, for your, your overall sense of these, of these new policies. Can we agree that some of it for really small time crimes, you know, prostitution, marijuana may make sense? But when we're talking about some of these other crimes, that it really just may be bad for the cities? I, b- I believe, honestly, that the low-level offenses, like low-level drug possession, marijuana possession, petty theft, fair evasion, even prostitution, I think those low-level offenses should more or less be decriminalized or at least receive citations in lieu of arrest. Hold people accountable, but don't put them in jail. Anything that has to do with even misdemeanor assault, um, where there's violence used, any type of weapon, dangerous instrument, I don't think we could just, you know, just look the other way on that. And tell us what, what your studies show about this. I'm going I'm to ask in a moment, you both have been former cops. I'm going to ask Sean in a moment for sort of the, the, the cop perspective on this. But I want to tap into your, your criminologist and your studies for a moment. What do the numbers uh, show us about what the impact of these kinds of changes are? 
Well, honestly, Baltimore was the first to implement the decriminalization of most offenses, low-level offenses, and they did see one of the smallest increases in homicide at 3%, whereas the rest of the nation saw an average, a substantial average, and 30% overall across the board. So even implementing those decriminalization across, you know, the, what the ADA implemented a few years back, it didn't correlate to a very high spike in violent crime or homicide. So that is somewhat promising, but at the same time, we can't really assess data longitudinally right now. And COVID, it threw a very interesting variable into the equation because we've never seen anything like this, or at least in our lifetime. And there's so many aspects to why violent crime, particularly homicides, have increased the last two years. It's not, we can't just blame COVID. We can't just blame George right. Floyd. So it's really hard to pinpoint one specific thing. Right. But but and uh, Sean, it seems to me that without any data to back up that this is going to work, right, that this is a risky gambit for these cities to 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 take. Yeah, absolutely is. You know, here in Oklahoma a few years ago, we actually um, took simple possession of any drug, PCP, crack, meth, or anything like that, regardless of somebody's criminal history, and they made that a misdemeanor. And from those of us in law enforcement, what was frustrating about that is the guys that we're chasing, the violent offenders, those that are doing armed robberies, those that are doing shootings, those that are doing homicides, a lot of times you have either victims or witnesses that are not cooperating. So sometimes the only way you can get these violent guys off the street are these small, low-level crimes. And you're taking them off the street you know, for, for a short time period, sure, but they are not out there wrecking havoc any longer. And, and Sean, I got to tell you, I am particularly bothered by this notion that resisting arrest is being treated as some sort of minor technical violation. Yeah, you know, I, I read up on that just a little bit ago, and from my understanding, they will only charge resisting arrest if it involves a felony. So, you know, re resisting a police officer, resisting arrest, you know, fighting against a cop, it's the same regardless. It doesn't matter if the crime is you know, a petty larceny or a shoplifting or if it's for an armed robbery. Resisting arrest is resisting arrest. So if we're going to take a lot of these crimes, uh, decriminalizing, you know, knocking the punishment down to essential verbal warnings, you know, slap on the hands, why wouldn't somebody resist arrest every single time against police officers? And this is how police officers are going to get hurt. But I also think you're going to have more use of force involving officers against suspects that are resisting them for crimes that aren't or not are, that are not even going to be prosecuted, um, I just see nothing but disaster ahead with that uh, that decision there. All right, and, and Jillian Snyder, let me ask you now to put back on your hat as a former police officer. What do you make of, of that particular piece of this? That resisting arrest in many of these cases is going to be viewed as something like marijuana use. I can't. I honestly, I couldn't believe it when I read it. I mean, the police are the law, and you're supposed to listen to the law. And when a police order, when a police officer gives you a lawful instruction, you are supposed to follow it. Um, resisting arrest, in my mind, is is considered violent. You are doing everything in your power to physically resist an officer placing you into custody. So I was very, very astounded when I read that, and I really don't agree with it only being you know, upheld if it's in association with the violent felony. Um, I just think if you fight the police, you should get arrested. Yeah, and look, Sean, you and I have had conversations in private about reforms that can happen, right? And you've said, you know, some police departments are better than others. Uh, <clears throat> some have better training than others, et cetera. It's not sure. like you're the kind of person who says, everything about policing is great. Everything police do all the time is right. You never say that. Um, you, you always look at things and say, where are their areas for improvement? But it seems to me if someone is coming to you and say, all right, Sean, how do we do this? If the DA came to you and said, how do we improve this? How do we better decide which cases to prosecute and which ones not to prosecute? What would you say? You know, and, and that's something, you know, I, I, here in Tulsa, I was very fortunate. I had a great working relationship with our Tulsa County District Attorney's Office from, from the DA himself down to the gang prosecutors and things like that. And the guys in my unit, we were able to have that type of dialogue uh, with our prosecutors quite often. You know, hey, here's a case. This guy's not really a bad guy. What can we work out for him? Or, hey, the opposite. This guy is a bona fide problem in our city. He needs to be locked up. But to just have from the very beginning 
a crime that's being committed, you as an officer that responds out there and you know this is going nowhere. Nobody is going to get prosecuted for it. Uh, and especially yeah. in a city the size of, of New York, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you address it. I'll be very honest. I right. don't know how you'd go out. And that. I'll say this, Jillian Snyder, I will bet you that some of these big cities are going to end up reversing course on this policy. Do you agree with me? I do, because they're they're trying to move too far ahead too quickly. We need to implement small reforms, especially with large agencies. I worked for NYPD. That was where I came from. And we did not, we were not as fortunate to have such a wonderful relationship with our DAs. Oftentimes we would make an arrest, a lawful arrest, and the DAs were like, eh, we're not gonna prosecute that. And we're like, but they broke the law, we have probable cause, eh, we're not gonna win, eh, just throw it out. And that went on for years. Um, we really were not fortunate to have the best relationships working in the Bronx and in Brooklyn, that's where I primarily worked. Um, but I think that the major cities that are seeing the biggest uptick in crime, um, they're trying to be too progressive, do too many changes at one time, and it's really gonna pose a problem. Yep, and I think what you're gonna hear from is you're gonna hear from citizens who are gonna, he who are gonna read about stories, right? This is what the media does, right? They'll pick a single story and they'll, they'll blow it up uh, and maybe even out of proportion. The issue is going to be it's not going to be a single incident. That's the difference. When you're talking about releasing people en masse like this, yeah, the media may highlight a single incident and say, aha, look at this guy, horrible, terrible, has been released. That's not even the issue. The issue is going to be the more day-to-day -day aspects of policing in America, policing in these big cities, uh, the sense that Police officers won't bother making arrests in, in a lot of these cases. And in particular, with this resisting arrest stuff, it really makes me crazy. But anyway, all right. You guys are the experts, and I'm sitting here ranting about it. Jillian Snyder, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. And Sticks, we're going to check in with you later. Yes, sir. All right. Also coming up, the Glenn Maxwell guilty verdict really may now be overturned. Two jurors today announced they may have improperly impacted deliberations by talking about a past history of sexual abuse themselves. And the question is, did they tell the court about it? This is a real problem. Up next. The guilty verdicts, though, could now really be in trouble. Remember, she was convicted of aiding Jeffrey Epstein's sexual abuses. I don't say this lightly when I say that the, the verdicts could be overturned. I hear arguments all the time. Oh, they're going to appeal. And I always explain why that's not going to uh, really change anything. But this is different. A juror said in post, that, that juror said in post-verdict interviews, he'd been a victim of sexual abuse. He also said, as you heard, he viewed as a predator the moment he locked his eyes on her. And that he may have swayed his fellow jurors' opinions when he described his own experience. He said, quote, when I shared that, they were able to sort of come around on they were able to come around on the memory aspect of the sexual abuse. Now, on a written questionnaire that all prospective jurors had to fill out, they were specifically asked, have you or a friend or family member ever been the victim of sexual harassment, sexual abuse, or sexual assault? Meanwhile, a second juror told the New York Times today that she discussed her experience as a victim of sexual abuse as well during deliberations. Now, if they did not disclose this on their jury questionnaires, then this could mean big trouble for the case. Typically, if they had said yes, the judge and lawyers would ask follow-up questions to ensure that they could be objective. And remember, the jurors are not supposed to be using their personal experiences. They're supposed to be using the evidence. Joining me now is Adam Klasfeld, managing editor for Law and Crime, who has covered Maxwell's trial from day one. Adam, thank you for coming back on the program. Appreciate it. All right, let me start by saying, do we have any sense of what these jurors did or did not say on their questionnaires in response to that question? So that is the key question that we don't know the answer to at this point. We do know that the defense attorneys for Glenn Maxwell say that uh, Scotty David in particular wasn't being honest in his in what he wrote in the questionnaire uh, in during the voir dire. Uh, but we don't know any details beyond that. We don't know. There was a, uh, in the questionnaire, the 
there was basically three categories. They were asked point blank uh, whether they or someone they knew, a family member, was a victim of se sexual abuse. They could have checked yes for themselves, yes for family and friend, or no. Uh, we don't even know what box was checked in this instance, but we know that it was serious enough that the prosecutors themselves tried to get ahead of this, and they called for an inquiry even before the defense did. It was their letter that hit the docket first, and then the defense motions came coming. They, there's already been a request for a new trial. There has already uh, been a judge's order to uh, offer this the first juror, the juror whose video that you showed, uh, an attorney. And that attorney has made a notice of appearance. That's how serious uh, this and how quick this development has been. And I think you raise a very important point, which is that the prosecutors recognize this wasn't just a defense motion where the defense says, oh, we want a new trial. Oh, this is a real problem. The prosecutors know here that they have a problem. The question is just going to be, how big a problem do they have? So what happens now, Adam? Right now, there's a question of whether there will be a follow-up inquiry. Of the two parties on that issue, it's the prosecutors that want that follow-up inquiry. The defense position on this is, we don't need that inquiry. We have all the information that we need based on the jury questionnaire and based on this public reporting. Uh, they want a new trial. So the judge will first hear briefing on the question of, will there be an inquiry? This isn't going to happen immediately. This is going to, the briefing schedule means that this will happen uh, and be briefed well into February. Uh, that said, there's that preliminary question. And then after that is briefed, will there be an inquiry? Uh, and will there be, a, finally, a new trial? And uh, how will this play out in appellate issues, if not? Well, and again, we should be clear, this would be a disaster for prosecutors and for the court if there's a new trial. I mean, if this actually happened, right, if two jurors did not, that's an if, if these jurors did not disclose on their questionnaires that they had been victims of sexual abuse, and they then went back into deliberations and talked about their personal experiences with sexual abuse, there are going to be real questions about how that happened. And what typically happens in these kinds of cases is jurors say, well, I didn't understand the question. It was a mistake. I certainly didn't mean to do it. And that'll be the, 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 the legal question as to whether the, the jurors get in trouble. But man, once you, once you talk about jurors who are admitting that they may have swayed the jury by talking about their personal experiences, I can't see how this case doesn't get overturned if they weren't honest on their jury forms about it. And the experts I've been speaking to as well have said that same thing, that this is, could clearly cause a new trial for Glenn Maxwell. Uh, some said there is a critical question of whether he realized that he was making a mistake, the, whether he was intentionally trying to mislead the right. court. Uh, but that said, the defense attorneys have said whether or not there was an intent there, if it was on that yep. material fact, their argument is that this should have a new trial regardless of that issue. And it's so serious well, that, of course, as I, as I mentioned, uh, the judge has offered him counsel and he has an attorney who has already made an appearance with the court. Right. And, and that is a critical question in determining how much trouble the juror will be in. But I think the defense right. is right that regardless of whether he did it on purpose or not, if he did not disclose it and he did exactly as he says, I don't see how they don't give Glenn Maxwell a new trial, which is just shocking. Um, Adam Klasfeld, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Coming up, text from Sean Hannity from January 6th causing a stir. Why is no one saying that he was actually doing the right thing? Why? Because none of his ideological foes can ever give him credit for anything. What's up next? Time for our Media Act Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Texts from Fox host Sean Hannity to then-Chief of Staff Mark Meadows have been released and are creating, 
quite a stir in the media. The bottom line is the text show that Hannity is trying to offer then-President Trump and his team sober warnings and guidance on how to bow out gracefully after Trump lost the 2020 election. Quote, I do not see January 6th happening the way he is being told. After the 6th, he should announce he will lead the nationwide effort to reform voting integrity. I'm very worried about the next 48 hours, Hannity said. He also said then after January 6th, he implored the president to let it go, saying, quote, he can't mention the election again, ever. The substance of what he said should lead everyone, including the left-leaning media, to give him credit for trying to talk some sense into the former president. But of course, most just can't do that because it would be bad for business. I think the big question that a lot of people are going to want to know, including Sean Hannity's viewers, is what is Sean Hannity hiding? What does Hannity know that he's been hiding from his audience? Now, does every member of the media publicly disclose all their communications with the people they cover? Of course not. There are real questions about why it sounds like Hannity is leading the team rather than serving as an analyst or observer. But why can't they at least just say, good for Sean Hannity for saying what he did? And Sean Hannity does not give complicated advice. Sean Hannity is not difficult to understand. If these guys need proof that Hannity was giving advice that they should support, look no further than Donald Trump himself, who scolded Hannity with a statement that read, I disagree with Sean on that statement, and the facts are proving me right. There isn't anything to disagree with Hannity on, but I will say that at least one person gave credit where it was due, even if it was in a, a backhanded way. MSNBC's Chris Hayes. Now, that is Sean Hannity warning Mark Meadows one week before the insurrection that January 6th is not going to go the way that Trump thinks it will and is being told it will, and that Trump should gracefully step aside, which I got a few things to say about that. He's right. You go, Sean. Well, even with a little snark, it's better than most. Look, on his show, Hannity regularly sowed unsubstantiated doubt about the election results that created many of the problems both before and after January 6th. But he was right to warn about January 6th. He understood what was happening and did what he could without, well, publicly shaming his team. And I, for one, give him credit for it. That's our wrap up. Today's media bias, Buzz and Bull, still to come. A convicted sex offender who goes by the name Pirate is now a free man despite a long, ugly history of violent crimes against women. When we go through the crimes, you too will ask, how could this happen up next? A violent convicted sex offender walks out of an Idaho prison after accepting a plea deal and 515 bucks in court fees. This guy, whose legal name is Pirate, yes, that's his name, pled guilty after using cigarettes to burn a woman with disabilities in November of 2020. Yesterday, he was sentenced to time served after he spent a year in Idaho's Bannock County Jail before his release in December. The November 2020 attack is just the latest run-in with the law for Pirate, who has a lengthy criminal past that spans across several states and includes charges of kidnapping and sexual assault. Pirate changed his name from Daniel Selovich in 2013. He initially faced multiple felony counts, but as part of that plea agreement, the charges were reduced to misdemeanors the Idaho attack, just the latest in a long history of crimes against women. Here's just part of his rap sheet. 2004, he raped a woman, woman in Redding, California, plead guilty in 2010, served four years in prison. Also in 2004, broke into a Las Vegas motel room, sexually assaulted a woman, beat her with a belt, pled guilty in 2018, and was sentenced to five years behind bars. 2015, Pirate allegedly held a woman captive for five weeks in a remote Alaskan cabin, sexually assaulting and beating her daily. The hostage managed to call for help and was rescued by helicopter. Before Hi Pirate could go to trial, the woman died and the case was dismissed. It was the DNA in this case that connected Pirate to the Las Vegas sexual assault. Pirate has even boasted about his history of being able to avoid going to prison for long periods of time. This is what he said to Redding, California's ABC affiliate, KRCR, in early 2020. 
all these charges are either going to drop down to petty stuff or are going to throw out. These are charges that the minimum usually is 15 years. The maximum is life. You can Google it. And there's people doing a lot of people in California, every state I've been to that I get these crazy charges that doing life or 25 to life typically over these type of charges. Now, either I'm the luckiest guy alive or maybe there's more to these stories. Even he realizes he shouldn't be free. There are even online efforts, including this Facebook page, that track pirates' whereabouts to try to help warn the public. Joining me, someone who has covered pirates' extensive background, is Eric Grossarth. He's a reporter for EastIdahoNews.com. Eric, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, look, I will admit that I did not follow this case uh, before I read about it recently. Uh, so I come into this and I look at that background and I say to myself, how could this have possibly happened? Am I missing something here? You know, these are a lot of those cases where it's a he, he said, she said type of deal. There is Pirate who's in the instance with the victim. There's not many other witnesses to this. He was in a remote cabin with that victim in Alaska. And then here in this incident, here in Idaho, he was just him and the victim at this house most of the time. So it's one of those cases where you don't have a lot of physical evidence to tie him to any kind of crime at all. So he reaches these plea deals, which gets him out of custody relatively soon for those crimes. But, but there were the earlier cases where he was convicted of horrible offenses. So I would think that prosecutors would be reluctant to cut any kind of deal with him that would get him out. I get it. Your point is that prosecutions can be tough, that if they don't feel like they have a, a, an incredibly solid case, sometimes they'll, they'll cut a deal. I, I get that. But with someone with this kind of violent background, it really surprises me. Again, I don't know the prosecutor's office the way that you do, so I'm just trying to figure this out. You know, going into this case, they saw a, a sentencing enhancement for pirates. So if he was convicted, they would try to tack on additional years to his sentence with that sentencing enhancement. Then the case kept getting delayed again and again because of the coronavirus. And he comes up to about a year behind bars here in Bannock County and says, hey, look, I'll take this plea deal. You drop it to misdemeanors. Let me out and we'll get this case out of your hands. We won't keep delaying it anymore. And prosecutors were kind of in this Idaho case in an interesting predicament. There was not a lot of evidence other again than what that witness said. She testified at an earlier preliminary hearing, came up with some different details of her story uh, then she originally told police saying that she was a little hesitant to come forward at first with those details. So again, it's one of those cases where Pirate says, hey, it didn't happen that way. And the victim feels that they were violated by this man. So prosecutors, again, what do they go off? The word of this woman or Pirate? So it left them with a really hard case. And to them, they just wanted to get some sort of conviction and get Pirate out of the state or wherever he is going since that is kind of his pattern of just well, moving from place to place. Well, that's what I want to ask you, because, you know, I think this guy is a dangerous guy. What do we know about his location now? Is he still in Idaho? You know, a search of the National Sex Offender Registry shows that Pirate is a transient person living in the San Francisco area. But they haven't been able to confirm that because he doesn't have an actual physical address to go off of on that sex offender registry. And he appeared on camera during the sentencing. I was able to watch that over Zoom and it appeared he was in some kind of car or homeless encampment. So we don't really know how to track this guy or where he is, but I'm sure at some point those facial tattoos will pop up again somewhere in one of these Facebook groups that have been dedicated to trying to warn the public again where he is and what he is accused and convicted of in the past. Yeah, I was gonna say that the good news is it's not like he's gonna be hard to spot, right? It's not like people are gonna, you know, it's not like he can go in disguise. They're gonna find this guy. Um, and, and there are these big social media efforts, as you were just mentioning, uh, to try to ensure that people know about him, where he is, um, and warning uh, women around the country about him.
All right. Eric Grossar, thank you very much for taking the time. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Still to come, a crash on a highway. That's the mangled wreckage. There were survivors. But the only reason they may be alive today is thanks to a loyal pooch who led police to the scene. It's coming up. Tonight, we're bringing the story of a dog that's being called a real-life lassie. Tinsley saved her owner when she led police officers to the car for her best friend, Cam Laundrie, and another man after they were ejected during a rollover crash on the New Hampshire-Vermont border. Police first responded to the scene of a loose dog on the highway. Tinsley, the Shiloh Shepherd, however, refused to be caught and instead kept running. Officers followed her, and that's when they discovered Laundrie's car down in the embankment. Officers were able to render aid while waiting for an ambulance. Both men were taken to the hospital. Laundrie's been released, but his friend Justin Connors is still being treated, and sadly, Connors' bulldog, also in the car, died at the scene. Joining us now is Lieutenant Dan Baldessari from the New Hampshire State Police, whose officers were involved in the incident. Lieutenant, thank you so much for coming on the program. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. All right, so tell us, you know, tell us what happened from their perspective. So our trooper got a call um, about 10 o'clock Friday night of a canine running on Interstate 89, right in Lebanon, which borders Vermont, um, which is not uncommon to get a, a call for a, a loose dog or a loose animal. Um, on the highway and once he did locate the dog, it didn't have a, a collar. Um, he tried to corral it, wasn't able to, but noticed that the dog was not really running away from him, was a little bit skittish, but he tried to get it off the highway and instead of the dog leaving the highway, it kind of kept running north and running north. So instead of um, backing away, he followed the dog. Uh, the dog brought them right over the Vermont uh, bridge to a damaged guardrail section and as they looked over the embankment, they saw there was a uh, pickup truck that had been in a pretty serious crash with two gentlemen uh, laying outside the truck and who was seriously injured. And at that time, they were both suffering from hypothermia. And that allowed our trooper to call for, um, for aid and notify Vermont State Police of, of the crash as well. So the, the officers must have realized at some point that the dog was taking them somewhere, right? Meaning... They're, they're, they obviously made the decision to follow the dog. Was there something that they told you about the way the dog was moving, et cetera, that led them to believe we should follow this dog? Yeah, they described it to me as um, if you've seen it run away and then kind of turn around and look back at you to see if you're following behind them. And not so much a chasing after them, but the dog wouldn't leave the highway. It kept, it kept running forward, stopping kept running forward, stopping again. So at that point, they thought, well, maybe it's leading us somewhere. Let's follow it and see where it goes. Uh, maybe it'll go off the highway on its own. And instead, it brought them to that guardrail damage, which, to their surprise, to see that type of crash, um, they were in disbelief. And, and just give me a sense in terms of um, the amount of space we're talking about. How far was it from where they first see the dog until the scene of the crash? About. About a mile, about a mile wow. from they make wow. contact with the dog and then get over the bridge and um, get to that guardrail. It was, it was probably no more than a mile, but just about. Wow. Um, and do you think it's fair to say that these guys might have died if, um, if Tinsley hadn't led them there? I think um, the odds would have been against them given the uh climate conditions you know not being a medical professional i'd say that the outcome certainly would have been different had that dog not found them um the climate aside they both had serious injuries so it's un unknown how long they would have been there till um someone would have noticed that kind of damage or yeah. the truck which wasn't even visible from the road now tinsley's owner was ultimately charged with uh driving under the influence correct that is my understanding, yes, from Vermont State Police. Right. So in Vermont, uh, he was charged uh, with that DUI there. Um, and, you know, we'll have to see what happens uh, with that. 
But certainly it's a, you know, regardless of what the owner did, Tinsley deserves enormous credit. Look, and I give the officers credit. I, I'm asking these questions about the officers watching Tinsley to sort of get a sense of what it was that led them. Because for them to walk a mile behind a dog tells me that they knew something was up. And I think that's great. Um, so, Lieutenant, thank you so much for joining us. Um, please uh, send our, our regards to the, uh, the two troopers who were involved. Um, we appreciate it. I will. Thank you again for having me. Coming up, a traffic stop spirals out of control, turning into a hostage situation. Standoff at a high school involving SWAT officers and police chopper. We'll show you the explosive body cam up next. We're on scene tonight with helicopter and body cam video from the San Diego Police Department. Again, showing the dangers officers face across the country. Police were chasing a car on an expressway driven by Christopher Marquez, who had been involved in a shootout with an officer days earlier and who also had shot a bail bondsman. During the chase, Marquez fired shots at police at least three times. After leaving the expressway, the suspect drove towards a high school that was closed for the day. All right, he's at a gate. Just ran the gate into a complex, looks like a uh, high school football field. Uh, coming across the football field. Uh, it's going to be 1405 Park Boulevard. 1405 Park Boulevard. Hi. Vehicle's coming to a stop. All right, we got two running. Marquez and a woman in the passenger seat ditched the car. They ran and climbed an embankment, then hid in some bushes. During that time, officers set up a perimeter around the campus. Police saw Marquez holding a rifle as he and the woman moved from the bushes, then hid in a dumpster. Emergency note negotiators and the SWAT team were called in. A standoff continued for 11 hours. At one point, Marquez gave a handgun to police in exchange for a bottle of water, but he kept his rifle. Officers could hear Marquez becoming more agitated as the woman tried to get away from him. She's been trying to get out, and he's been pulling her back in. So this is like a classic hostage situation for what we're seeing from up here. Yeah, she's crying and stuff. And she's, she's crying. Going. She's every time she tries to get up, and she's pulling her down. As officers held their positions, they saw Marquez pushing the woman, and he started moving the rifle towards her. Oh, I see a gun. Yep. I got a gun. I can't. I got nothing. I got nothing. I got it now. I'm gonna take the shot. Two officers shot Marquez, who died at the scene. Police then deployed flashbang devices and were able to get the woman to safety. She was not harmed. She was arrested for car theft, identity theft, and being an accessory to a crime after the fact. No officers were injured. Wow. Joining me again, Sean Sticks Larkin, retired Tulsa police lieutenant. All right, so Sticks, this is a tricky situation, right? Because you have this woman who is initially an accomplice who then becomes a victim. Yeah, and that's exactly, you hit it right on the head, watching this, uh, you know, the full video here. She's a willing participant in this thing initially, uh, you know, in, involved in the car that we're seeing her bail out. I mean, she's the driver of that car. And it, after the 11 hour, uh, you know, uh, or, ordeal in this dumpster, she decides, hey, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be a part of this. I want out. But the desperate suspect, he knows if she's gone, he's there by himself. And that's something that he's trying to hold on to, which forces the officers to use deadly force. And you heard the officers and you heard, uh, you know, a member, I guess it was of, of the SWAT team there, making the decision about when it was safe to shoot. Yeah, you know, and, and we, we discussed this before is, you know, I was a member of the SWAT team here in Tulsa for seven years, and, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, bravado stuff, cool things about being part of a SWAT team. I mean, there's a lot of great training, a lot of camaraderie, but that's what the majority of your time on that team is. It's training, it's preparation for this type of deal. There's actually very few instances where we have to use force. Um, you know, most, most hostage-type situations or barricaded subjects even, uh, it, it, it's like 95% of them are cleared by negotiations, you know, somebody giving themselves up peacefully. And it's not something an officer wants to do. 
They were out there for 11 hours talking to this guy. And because of the suspect's actions towards the female, it forced him to, you know, have to take that shot shot to put an end to this. Um, It's not something that was taken likely. And I was really interested in the fact that part of the negotiation was this trade for one of his guns for a bottle of water? Yeah, you know, uh, and not to to, to story tell here, but on one of the times I was on the team, uh, we did the same type of thing. We traded a gun for a pack of cigarettes. Um, We actually used it as a ruse to get the person to come out to the street to get the cigarettes, which put us between him and the house where we were able to actually take him into custody. So, you know, in, in this deal right here, they're on an empty school campus. There are no other citizens, obviously no kids there that are at risk. They've got the situation contained. Time is on their hands. You know, this thing ended at 11 hours. I assure you it would have gone on much, much longer had it, uh, you know, uh, if it was needed, if the suspect's actions didn't dictate what needed to be done. Tell me about the use of the flashbang devices. So, so a flashbang is the, the common terminology. It's actually called an FSDD, which is a flash sound diversionary device. Um, and that's exactly what it, you know, just in its description, um, extremely, uh, you know, it, uh, loud audible noise, bright flashes of light. Even here in the daylight, you can see them going off. And it's done to distract or disorient somebody, which can allow the officers then to move up and do whatever, uh, you know, what they've pre-planned essentially. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sticks, thank you. As always, we appreciate it. Sorry we weren't able to see you in person. We were thrilled that we were able to see you earlier. So uh, we feel we've gotten our um, our dose of sticks. So we, sticks we think fixed? we're good. Yeah, we yeah, got our here sticks in Oklahoma. Fixed. We're hoping to get running water soon as well, besides the internet. Yeah. So thanks, buddy. <laughs> All right. See you later. Coming up, we love hearing from you, the viewers. We've been having some of you on Zooming in live. Reach out. Tell me what I'm getting wrong. Tell me what I'm getting right. Discuss an issue. Discuss the show. I'll have you on. It's newsnationnow.com slash D-A-L. Let's keep the debate going. Coming up, News Nation Prime with Barney Hughes. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.